We've covered Mary and Joseph, and today I want to look at another side of it. The baby has been born in a manger. In Luke 2, verse number 8, it says, That night, the night the baby was born, there were shepherds staying in a field nearby. They were guarding their flock of sheep, because I guess that's what shepherds do. And suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord surrounded them. I love that. And they were terrified. Kind of a common thread through the Christmas story. Every time the angel shows up, they were terrified. These angels must have been some fierce looking creatures. But the angel reassured them, do not be afraid. Two things I want you to see. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Can we just drill in on that for a minute? Said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring what? Great joy. I bring good news that will bring great joy to all people. I love that. What is the good news that will bring great joy to all people? Well, the good news that will bring great joy is that the Savior, yes, the Messiah, he's been born today in Bethlehem the city of David. Good news will bring great joy that a Savior was born. Ladies and gentlemen, that is why I love Christmas because it is good news and it is great joy that Jesus was born, born in a manger, that God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus for you and I. It was good news. And it brought great joy. And that joy is still living on today. The title of my message, if you're taking notes today, is this. Head up, eyes open, and heart engaged. Head up, eyes open, and heart engaged. Can I pray with you? Father, thank you so much for our church. Thank you for each and every one of us today that are in this room and Father, I pray today that your word would be living and active. May it be alive. God, I pray that it would do more than just inspire us, but it would transform us. In Jesus' name. And the whole church said, amen. Amen, Amen, everybody. Thank you so much, my man, Melvin. Well, if you're a follower of Jesus, I can almost promise you, promise you this week, you will have multiple opportunities If your head is up and your eyes are open and your heart is engaged to tell somebody some good news that whether they know it or not can bring them some great joy. It's what Christmas is all about. There are more people open to an invitation to receive Jesus during Christmas than any other time of the year, even more than Easter. See, one invitation, whether you realize it or not, has the power to change everything in someone's life. Anybody ever received an invitation in your life that changed some things? Maybe you think of that invitation that you got. It came in the form of an email, maybe. And that email changed some things when you got that email and you got that job interview. And then you showed up at the job interview. And that job interview, after you landed that job, it changed your family's life. It changed your life. Maybe it was the invitation that you got where you finally nailed you know, that, that uh, you know, not, not that just that job promotion, but, you know, that project that you got and you got that feedback that was like, because of this, I want to invite you to this. And then whatever this was, it changed everything. Yeah. It was the invitation that you got when your now spouse said yes at one point. Yes, I will marry you. Yes, I will spend my life with you. And that invitation Ultimately, it changed everything. There's some kids in this room because that invitation changed everything. Invitations have great power. And so does the invitation that we have the power to extend this Christmas season to someone far from God, but maybe close to you. All of you know someone in your life that is far from God, but close to you. And you're here today most likely because of an invitation. You're in this room because somebody invited you. Maybe social media, an ad invited you. Maybe it was a friend or family member that invited you. Maybe it was a mom or dad that just drug you. But you were invited to church 
And how many of you know at some point in your walk with God, you were invited, you showed up, and that invitation changed everything. You're better for it now. Your marriage is better for it now. Your walk with God that you now have, you celebrate it. It brings so much joy to your life and so much peace to your life because you just said yes to Jesus. Invitations have incredible powers. And this week, I believe that if your head is up and your eyes are open and your heart is engaged, you may be face-to-face with an interaction that may seem just like a normal interaction. It may just be the new person at the office. It may just be the person giving you coffee. But I have learned that those moments sometimes can be divine appointments. That can be divine moments that are spiritual opportunities where God chooses you to be a voice of hope, to be a messenger, to bring good news that can bring great joy. See, when God prompts you, you have really two options. You can pray and you can respond boldly to bring good news to someone, or you can hesitate. Anybody ever hesitated? I don't know what it is about God's promptings in my life, but I feel like God always prompts me at inopportune times. Anybody ever been there? Like when you're in Chick-fil-A and that person next to you that you do not know, that is a stranger, that you just lock eyes with them. And in that moment, you think, I should invite them to church. There's something about it. I need to pray with them. I need to talk with them. And then in that moment, you're faced with a choice. Do I look really weird or do I just do it? And most of the time, guys, as your pastor, I just got to be honest with you. A lot of times when I'm faced with that, I've hesitated before because I'm like, what if these people think I'm strange? What if I don't get it? What if you weren't speaking to me? And then I've had moments where, and I know you've never been there, where you did open your mouth and you did say something and you did kind of like, you know, like, all right, I think I'm going to try this. And then what came out of your mouth, you weren't real happy with, you know, it's like, man, I botched that. I didn't do very good. You know, you're like backtracking. You're you're trying to say it seven or eight ways because you're like, I don't really know what to say. And then you say it and you're like, oh God, why did you prompt me to do this? Anybody ever been there or is that just me? And so those moments can lead us to feel, you know, a little hesitant. And then we're prompted again and we show up and we do have that neighbor. Liz was sharing the story about, did you share it a moment ago? About walking the dog and the neighbor. And, you know, like those moments can be a little awkward because it's like, what if I invite the neighbor that I see every day and then they say no and they think I'm weird and now I can't really walk down the same street anymore as them. And so enough of those moments can lead us to like hesitation. But I've learned this in my life. You never know. You never know what one moment of boldness can do to change someone's life. The angel of the Lord shows up to these shepherds and makes this really prophetic declaration. He says, I'm bringing you good news that will bring great joy to all people. And the good news is this, that a savior has been born in Bethlehem. Now you have to understand the scene and you have to understand the time in history that this prophetic declaration took place. This is after 400 years of silence. So you have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament. Well, between, you know, the Old and the New, the intertestamental period, you have 400 years of silence. And so people have been waiting for generations for this good news that would bring great joy. And one generation would pass to another and the good news kind of never came. And so 400 years of silence since God had spoke, 400 years since the prophet Malachi had said, hey, God's gonna turn the hearts of the father to the children and the children to the father and then just boom, silence. And after 400 years of silence, think about it. Savior is born And angels show up, not to a king, not to some priest, not to the elite, not to the powerful. The angel shows up to some shepherds on a quiet, dark night, tending a flock. I mean, if you're going to share some good news that's going to bring great joy to all people, don't you need to go to the powerful people? Don't you need to go to the people that kind of have it all together? Don't you need to go to the people that have the reputation, you know, that they can make a public announcement and it can really spread, you know, throughout the whole kingdom? I would go to the kings. I would go, you know, to the people that really had kind of the mouthpiece. And they show up to a group of shepherds and say, I got good news for you to share. Literally, the angels preach the gospel in this moment. Good news to the shepherds. And I want you to think about these shepherds. Have you ever thought about 
I know you probably haven't, first century shepherds. Um, but, you know, in, in this context, first century shepherds, some scholars believe that these were one of two types of shepherds. The first type of shepherd they could have been is a shepherd priest preparing for Passover. The second type of shepherd that scholars think they could be is just ordinary shepherds. And ordinary shepherds, what they do is they shepherd flocks. Now, here's what's interesting if you start researching and learning about shepherds. You know, when I think of shepherds, and I guess it's because King David was a shepherd, and so I think of it as this, like, very glamorous position, like, shepherds must have been very well respected, and everybody loves shepherds, and, you know, especially if the angels are going to show up, you know, to, to, to some certain people to bring news of great joy, to go tell everyone, it's probably going to be some pretty awesome people. No, shepherds in that time in the first century were actually known, and this is crazy, as untrustworthy. Four things about shepherds that you didn't know that I want to share with you today that may not matter to you, but now you'll know. Once you know, you can't unknow this. Shepherds were considered unreliable. Couldn't even testify in court. They rarely sold property because most assumed it was stolen. They were considered ceremonial, ceremonially unclean, not allowed to worship in the temple. And then they were considered social outcasts. I mean, they were like the bottom rung of the social structure. They were like, in that day and age, tax collectors and prostitutes. People would literally walk on the other side of the road when they saw shepherds coming. And here God sends heavenly hosts to choose a group of people to bring great news to. And he looks at a group of shepherds. And he said, even though you're social outcasts, Even though you're uneducated and unqualified and unremarkable, in a sense, I choose you. I choose you, shepherds, to bring good news to all people, and that good news will bring great joy. And here's the good news. A Savior has been born. I can only imagine in that moment how the shepherds must have felt. I can only imagine that the shepherds in that moment must have felt totally unqualified, right? I mean, like, who am I to bring good news to the whole world? After 400 years of silence, I mean, we're not pastors here. I mean, we're just sheep herders. We're watching our flock. And see, we've all been there. We've all been in those moments where God prompts us, where God maybe encourages us and nudges us to maybe go tell somebody about Jesus or to go pray with somebody or go strike up that conversation with a coworker or a neighbor or a friend. And what's our first response sometimes? Who am I? God, really me? I'm not qualified for that. I I don't know the gospel that well. I don't know if I can have that conversation with them. What if I botch it? What if I mess it up? What if I say the wrong thing? I mean, God, I barely picked up my Bible the last year. Like, me? Me? I want you to notice what the shepherds did. They didn't try to reason with the angels. They didn't look at the angels and say, guys, like, uh, it's not us. I mean, go find somebody else. There's a whole lot more people that can spread this message a whole lot better than us. And so please pass over us. No, they hear the word. They see the Savior. Before we get there, let's actually, verse number 16, if you're following along in our story, they hear the word and notice what they did. They hurry, so no hesitation, no hesitation at all. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And then verse number 17, after a moment with the Savior, it says, after seeing him, him, the baby boy, the shepherds then told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them. No hesitation, no waiting for the right time, No thinking about it. No, with spiritual urgency. They have a moment with the Savior, and then they go tell everybody about it. I wonder what it would look like this week if our head was up and our eyes were open and our heart was engaged to the people around us that maybe God would prompt you and maybe you would have an urgency without hesitation, a moment where you, just like these shepherds, would say, I got to tell you the good news. I got to tell you what Jesus has done in my life. 
I can't keep this inside. And so these shepherds, they hurried, they ran, and they told not just some, I love it, they told everyone. So in essence, we are here today because of the shepherds. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Here you have like the first evangelist. I mean, they hear the good news and then they go and they spread it. Yeah. Isn't that what we're all called to do? See, Jesus, right before he left, what did he do? He had this moment with his disciples and he commissioned them. And he gave them the great commission. And he said, here's the great commission. I want you to go into all the world and I want you to teach and I want you to preach. I want you to baptize and I want you to proclaim of my goodness, right? Yeah. Yeah. See, it was his great commission and it was his last words. I wonder what it would look like as believers, as followers of Christ, if his last words the last thing that he did became like our first and greatest responsibility. Yeah, okay. See, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Yeah. And then he commissioned us to go and share that same good news. Yeah. So here we see the shepherds receiving the good news and then go sharing the good news with everyone. Everyone I can only imagine that would listen. Everyone that would, uh, you know, give them an ear. They were going to share this news. I wonder if the next time you're presented with an opportunity instead of hesitation, maybe there would be a moment of boldness where you just stopped and you said, all right, I'm going to pray. And it can happen in a second. I'm going to pray and I'm going to trust. God, you're with me. God, I am worthy. I may feel unworthy. I may not feel qualified, but greater is he that's in me. God, you've changed my life. You've freed me. And God, if all I can do is share that with someone, I've got a story to tell. Right. See, it's so often that we can feel unworthy. I put this in my notes, inadequate, maybe unloved, maybe because of situations you've walked through this year. Maybe it was a divorce. Maybe it was a sin that had, you know, kind of came out and now you feel shame or maybe it was, you know, some mistakes that you feel like you made. And now because of this, you, you feel like you're not worthy to be able to spread the gospel anymore. You feel like God wouldn't want to use you. Well, God used a group of people that most people wouldn't thought yeah. would be used right. to go spread the good news, yeah, yeah. to go spread the gospel for the first time. See, when your life has been changed by Jesus, let me give you some, some help here. The good news is simply just sharing that life change with others. Yeah. You don't have to have it all figured out. Yeah, right. All you have to do is share what God has done in your life. Yeah. And so the shepherds met a baby and they couldn't keep that to themselves anymore. They told everyone without hesitation. And I want you to see verse number 18 that is so very powerful. It says, and all who heard the shepherd's story was astonished, yeah. astonished. All that heard it, all that heard the good news that would bring great joy were astonished. See, what if the fear, and I want to invite our keys to come back up, but what if the fear that we have sometimes in the moment um, you know, to invite because we think, ah, oh, they're going to think we're weird or they're going to think we're strange or they're going to think I'm just a pushy Christian or, you know, whatever it is. What if that fear in the moment, if we learn to kind of push through that, what if on the other side of that moment, instead of seeing somebody standing there ready to reject what you want to share with them, actually were astounded by what you shared with them? What if the good news that came out of you brought great joy in their lives? Isn't that beautiful to think of? That there's some good news in you that God wants to use to bring great joy in people. There's some good news in you that God wants to share through you that literally people might leave astounded by. What if there were people that were waiting? That literally, God has been perfectly positioning you to be the messenger for. 
What if you determine, I won't hesitate, but with boldness, I'll proclaim. With boldness, I'll say, you know what, God? Even though it can sometimes feel hard to be used by you, I'm going to trust that you want to use me to make a difference in this world. See, no one is too far from God's love. No one in our lives are too low that God can't reach down and pick them up. This Christmas, I have a challenge for us. Next week is Christmas, 23rd, 24th. So we have six and eight on Saturday, nine and 11 on Sunday. I have a challenge for us, and here's the challenge. The challenge is for us to partner together. Um, you know, God uses everyday, ordinary people, just like me and you, to do extraordinary things. But I understand that when you hear a message like this, even though I've tried to encourage you the best I can, you know, like you can do this, you got this, you don't have to be afraid, Monday can happen. And the Starbucks line, there you are, you know? And you're prompted. But you're like, oh, I don't think I could do it, maybe next year. I get it. So I wanna help you, I wanna do something uh, this year, I want to extend an invitation to you uh, to partner with you. So here's what I want to I want to encourage you to do. What if this year we could partner together? And uh, as a church, we'll do what only we can do, and then you do what only you can do. Let me explain it a little better. See, I can't invite your coworker. I don't know. I can't invite your family member. I don't know. But what I can do is I can do my very best once you invite them to deliver the gospel in a way next week where, you know, when they're sitting in here giving God a shot, that next week the gospel is presented in such a way that you can trust your friend, your coworker, your family member will have an opportunity to meet Jesus. Next week, what I can promise you I can do is bring good news that I've been praying will bring great joy to many people in our city. So you do what only you can do. We'll do what only we can do and we can partner together. So you may be thinking, I can't share the gospel. I don't know, you know, all the things. What if they ask me a really hard Bible question? I don't have it all figured out. Just invite them. Just be honest. Say, you know what? I don't really have it all figured out, but I do know And if you come with me this Saturday, this Sunday, God is going to be in the room. Jesus will be there. And I know, I know that I know that God's going to speak to you in a great way. And we'll find out those answers together, all right? So which service you want to go to? You want to go to the 6? You want to go to the 8? And then you go to whichever one they want to go to. And I think this year, if we can partner together in that kind of way, And we'll see a lot of people. We'll see a lot of people not just fill up chairs in a room because that's never been what it's about. A lot of people say yes to Jesus. What would it feel like next week if I extended the moment, you know, at the end of service, you know, for people to give their lives to Christ and every head was bowed and every eye was closed. And in that moment, you know, your friend, your coworker, your cousin, that, you know, while every head was bowed and every eye was closed, you just kind of like peaked because you invited him. How would you feel in that moment if you peaked? You're like, and their hand went up. And they said yes to Jesus. You know how you'd feel? Amazed. You'd feel like, wow, how could God use me like that? And I think every follower of Christ needs to feel those moments because it's the moment where we sync up with our Father's mission. And when you experience moments like that, it changes everything. And it gives you courage for the next moment when you are in the Walmart line and God prompts you. Pray with Him. 
Invite them. Talk to them. Here's what I believe this week. If your head is up, if your eyes are open, your heart is engaged, God will use you. This Christmas, I believe we're going to see the lost found. We're going to see those that are, are, are bound restored. We're going to see those struggling with addiction lay down some things. We're going to see those walk in with depression and anxiety, walk out with joy and hope because Jesus is good news. And I believe the good news of Jesus is going to bring some great joy to a lot of people next weekend. And their lives are going to be forever changed. And so will you partner with us? May we take the greatest opportunity we have all year to extend an invitation where more people are willing to say yes than any other time. And would you just put it out there? And see. See if you don't get to experience a friend, a family member, a coworker feeling astounded by the love of Jesus. So I want to take a moment as we end service because we really, you have no idea what your moment of boldness can do. It can change a life forever. I want to take a moment as, you know, I had said a minute ago, I want to partner with you. One of the best ways I can do that is not just presenting the gospel next week in a clear way, but also um, I believe that we can partner together uh, by praying for those that you're praying for. So I would love to pray over those that you're praying for. And so if you'll go with me to lifepointlu.org slash my one. In fact, I'm going to ask that everyone will get their phone out right now. Go with me to lifepointlu.org slash my one. lifepointlu.org slash my one. There's just a couple spots to fill out on this. One is your name. And the other is just who you're praying for, who you're inviting this Christmas. And you don't have to put their first and last name. You can just put Bob. And if we have 100 Bobs, God can sort it all out, all right? He knows. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a cousin, you know, somebody that's close to you. And what I want to do is tomorrow as a staff, we're going to pull all these forms and uh, your name will be on it and whoever you put we're just going to pray we're just going to say God I'm praying right now for, for Steve and he's believing for Jerry I don't actually know who you're writing down but he's believing for Jerry and God we lift up Jerry to you and again we can do what we can do we can pray we can partner with you believing that God will give you the courage in that moment when you invite so if you'll put a name down, what we'll do as a church is we'll pray for you and we'll pray for that person. And what great joy it will be when you come tell me the story in two weeks about the name you wrote down and God doing something great in their life. And we're able to celebrate together. We're able to celebrate together God's goodness. Christmas is not just about us. It's not just about the petting zoo and the train rides and the hot cocoa. All those things are just really a draw. So when your, you know, friends and family are looking to go somewhere for Christmas, you're like, we got something for kids. You should come. And I hope when they get here, as soon as they walk in the parking lot, they feel the love of Jesus and the peace of God. So take a few moments. Give you about 30 seconds. And uh, I'm just going to kind of step over to the side. And I'd love for you to ask God, God, who is it that I need to invite? And God would put somebody on your heart and that you'd write that down on that form. This week, while you're faced with the hustle and bustle of Shelbyville Road and traffic on every corner, may your life not be consumed just with the hustle and bustle, but may there be a moment in the chaos you can pause and say, God, in the chaos, keep my head up, keep my eyes open, keep my heart engaged. 
and in a chaotic time where it's easy to just see us, may we see those around us. And may we spread the love of Jesus in a great way. Can you bow your heads with me all across this room? Maybe you're in here today and you're the one. I've been talking about inviting the one, but you're the one. You would say, you know what? I'm here today and I don't know Jesus. I'm far from him. But today I'm here. Somebody invited me. I showed up. And I need Jesus. If you're in this room today and you would say, that's me. I need Jesus today. I've been doing life my own way. And today I, I think I'm ready to just... Just say, God, I'm, I don't want to just give you a shot. I want to give you all my life. Come in. Make me brand new. You know, that moment doesn't have to be confusing. It's just a conversation, just like I'm having with you right now, that you can have with him. The Bible says that anyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's as simple as just saying, Jesus, I need you. And I don't want to do my life alone anymore. So I give you all of me. If today you would be so bold to say, I'm ready to make that decision. I'm ready to live for Jesus. I'd love to pray over you. I'd love to pray that God would give you the boldness to do so and that God would change your life in a moment from this day forward. Nobody's looking around. Nobody's going to single you out. But if that's you today, I would love to know who you are and just pray with you. Nobody looking around. If you would say, you know what, that's for me today. Just slip up a hand, put it right back down. You don't have to hold it high. Just love to kind of acknowledge you for a moment, be able to pray with you. Thank you, Lord. Well, Father, I pray that this room next week is full of people far from God. Full of people that need you. God, just don't fill a room to fill the room. But God, may the right people come, people that need you. God, this next week, God, may our eyes be open. And I pray it's a great Christmas for our church. And I pray that we all enjoy it. And I love worshiping this year together as a church. I love when we get to gather in seasons like this. God, I pray that it's also a year that we look back on that says, wow, God, so many people crossed from death to life that Christmas. So many people's lives was forever changed. So, Father, this week, would you give us the courage? As a church, may we have the boldness to share and to spread, to proclaim good news. God, may that good news bring great joy. We thank you. We love you so much. Father, I commission our church. May you give them acts to power. That power to be witnesses. Witnesses in the areas that you have perfectly positioned them. Fill them full of your spirit this week to have power to proclaim the good news. In Jesus' name.